stand together. Sing our theme song, Savior, like a shepherd, lead me and you too. Lead us. We'll sing verses uh, 1 and 3. Hymn number 150 in your songbooks. It's also in your program. Number 150, verses 1 and 3. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy folks prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Blessed to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. Thou hast mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, we will early turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day and for this meeting. We pray for our speaker, Lord, that you will fill him with your Holy Spirit and fill this place and each person here, Lord, the same. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let me quickly say welcome and good morning, everyone. Could I see the hands of those who are here for the presentation at 9 o'clock? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's looking lovely. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of homework. Can I do that? What I'm going to ask you to do for me is whoever you, are, you see on the outside, when you are coming here at 11 or at 9, please give them an invitation. Because we're having a grand hallelujah time down here. I'm telling you, I was truly moved by Sister Be um, Becky Rogers' um, presentation this morning. Don't we need more presentations like that? Oh, yes, we do. And our young people need it also. And so I'm going to ask you, as we are being blessed and revitalized and nourished over this week, of, of, um, over this week I'm going to ask you to take these messages back home to your churches with you and re-energize those people there also. It's my um, pleasure to welcome you this morning and remember the morning um, services, saints, at 6.30, at 9, at um, 11, and through the day. We have some beautiful speakers, and I know that you are going to be richly, richly blessed. God bless you, and have a good sitting today. Before I go, let me just introduce a few people who are on the platform with me. Um, you just heard from Pastor uh, Labrens Will Labrens. He was the rousing voice that you were hearing and following. And we also had on piano um, Jonathan Duman. He was the young man you saw there playing away for us. We have to my uh, um, immediate left uh, Elder Livermore, 
who will be introducing our speaker shortly. We have to my right, uh, Pastor Jeff uh, um, Crane, who you just heard with our prayer. And he will be having scripture reading for us shortly. God bless you, saints. Well, I hope you have your Bibles with you. If not, nowadays we have them on our phone, which is okay as well, as long as you have a Bible. Let's turn in our Bibles for our scripture reading to Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. The Bible says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. It's a real privilege of mine to introduce Steve Rogers to you. Um, Steve and I have worked together pretty close to 20 years. When I was pastoring at Kelso Longview in the Oregon Conference, uh, when I arrived, uh, I had been spent about three years over in Hawaii, I arrived over in Oregon, and Steve was a half-time Bible worker for the church. And it um, wasn't long, I don't remember the amount of time, but I said to him, I says, if, if I could get you the money, would you want to go full-time? And as he stands tall like he does, he looked at me and he said, I'm called to be a Bible worker. And I said, okay, so we worked together, uh, strung up enough money to, to give him a salary, and he worked uh, all that time, 13 plus years with me, um, as a full-time Bible worker. You know, we, we did a lot of baptisms uh, there over the course of those years. Uh, Steve Rogers was responsible for more than half of them. So, you know, the pastor tends to get the credit, but uh, the real worker was Steve. I really respect him. I uh, admire him. Like I was talking about Becky earlier at 9 o'clock, they're the kind of people that make you want to be better when you're around them. Um, I got a call to Spokane and kind of left pastoral ministry, went into the conference office in Spokane. And I was there about a year. We were having a discussion with the president and all of the uh, departmental workers, all of the administration. And we just felt we were not doing what we're called to do, just out of whack. And they looked at me and they said, well, what do you think? And, and I said, well, in all the sports that I played all my life, whenever we got fuzzy out there on the field or on the court, the coach would call a timeout and he would tell us, go back to your basics. You know, just go back to the basic fundamentals of the game. So I kind of told him that and I said, maybe we need to go back to Bible workers, you know, and LEs and that kind of thing. And they said, well, do you know anybody who would help us with that? I happen to know a guy. So I called Steve, and we brought him over from uh, Kelso Longview over to Spokane. He works in the office there. He was my assistant there for about five years, close to it. And he's still there now working with the fellow that replaced me. So in the time, we've hired 37 Bible workers there. Steve's all over, oversees that. I cannot recommend to you a better individual who can teach you how to give Bible studies. He's written his own series, but also how to find them. You know, he's a master at how to find Bibles. I've been out on the street with him. I've been knocking doors with him. So I know. So you're going to really enjoy these next several days uh, with what Steve has to uh, share with us. Steve, come up here and let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I want to pray for my brother, my friend, and I know your worker. I know his heart is right. I know he loves you with all of his heart. And all he wants to do is share the good news, the, the news that shaped and and carved into his life. Lord, he wants to share with others and see them respond to, to your wonderful gospel. So bless him as he presents. Uh, may he hear your voice as he's speaking, please. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and share with you folks. And I hope I can live up to all those nice words. He said there. We uh, know a lot of people here, see a lot of familiar faces here on the campgrounds, um, and of course the Livermores, and, and we, we love the Livermores. Um, we've worked together, like he said, close to 20 years. Um, he's been my pastor, my boss, 
my mentor, my friend, but after all these years, he's more like family, it seems like now. So we're just thankful to be here and for the opportunity to share with you over the course of the next couple days. And this one here I wanted to share with you is called How to Awaken a Sleeping Giant. Sound interesting? All right. Well, Jesus said, and you're familiar with this, he says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So we can expect a lot of similarities, he says, between Noah's time and our time. And one of those parallels there we find in, in uh, Genesis, he says this, and there were giants on the earth in those days. There were giants on the earth in those days. In Noah's days, God's people had to deal with giants. How about today? Do you have to deal with giants today? Have you ever seen a giant in your life? Well, there's been several pictures circulating on the internet recently of giants. Um, maybe you've seen Giant George. Now, in my work with Bible workers, one thing we do is a lot of canvassing, a lot of knocking on doors, and I can tell you knocking on doors, Giant George is the Bible worker's worst nightmare. Giant George stands 43 inches high at the shoulder and weighs 245 pounds. He's a blue Great Dane. Now that's a big boy, isn't it? Now how would you like to be knocking on doors and see Giant George come around the corner? He's the Bible worker's worst nightmare. I think the article, if I remember right, went on to say that Giant George goes through 50 pounds of dog food every two weeks. That's quite a dog food bill, isn't it? 50 pounds every two weeks. Have you ever seen a giant? Maybe you've seen Sultan Kosin standing next to He Ping Ping. I don't know if you've seen them. Now, Sultan stands 8 foot 1 inches tall, way up there. He Ping Ping is just under 2 feet 6 inches. Here they are standing together. The long and the short of it, huh? Have you ever seen a giant? There's all kinds of giants, different types of giants. Maybe you've heard of the Canadian legend of the sleeping giant. I don't know if you've heard of that one or not, but it goes something like this. Once upon a time, there lived a good giant who loved life and the people of the Ampa Valley. And as the legend goes, this giant would enjoy eternal life just so long as he promised to do harm to no one. Well, the day came when a bad giant, according to the story, enters the valley and threatens to harm these people. So the good giant, to protect the people he loved, he lured this intruder up to Steamboat Lake, where this bad giant supposedly falls in the quicksand and perishes there. Everybody was relieved to have that bad giant out of their life. But because he had broken his promise, they had to put the gentle giant to rest. And the day came, they had a ceremony, they laid the gentle giant to rest, and it says they put rattlesnakes around the base of his bed to protect his peaceful slumber. And if you were to travel to Ontario, Canada, and you were to look at these rock outcroppings from just the right angle, you can see what appears to be a giant on his back, fast asleep. The sleeping giant, they call him. At one time or another, I'm sure we've all heard folklore about some sleeping giant and the frightening potential if he should be awakened. Well, there's all kinds of giants. There's actual giants. There's fictitious giants. There's legendary giants, giants of reputation, good and bad. Maybe you've heard statements from this uh, man here, Yamamoto, the Japanese admiral who masterminded the attack on Pearl Harbor. Several statements have been attributed to this man, uh, of which these two come from him apparently upon learning the attack had been a success Admiral Yamamoto said to those around him gentlemen we have just kicked a rabid dog and he goes on to say I fear that all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and filled him with terrible resolve a sleeping giant you know if there's a mighty powerful giant in the enemy camp with, with destructive potential, capable of inflicting great harm, but who is fast asleep, probably the best thing to do would be to what? Let him sleep. Isn't that right? I mean, probably the best policy wouldn't be to, to sneak up and kick him or something, would it? No, leave him sleeping. 
Because while you're asleep, all your potentials, all your capabilities are neutralized while you're asleep. Well, the Bible also tells us about some mighty giants that went to sleep on duty. And you can think of them. Uh, there's several. You know, uh, of course, the first one that comes to mind is David, how he rocked the giant to sleep. David and Goliath, isn't that right? How the infamous and destructive force of Goliath was totally neutralized once God, through David, had put him to sleep. Or you think of Samson, God's agent for reform and deliverance for Israel, had his potential neutralized by what? Sleep. Isn't that right? While he was sleeping. Then there's others, some other, more of God's giants, capable of inflicting great harm to the enemy camp, were caught sleeping on duty. You know, these giants could have been the source of great strength and comfort to their Lord in his time of need, but they too were caught sleeping on duty, weren't they? While the Lord cried out in agony, they slept. Sleeping can be a dangerous thing, especially at the crucial time, can it? These historical figures, though, are not the only ones caught sleeping on duty. Who else does prophecy foretell would go to sleep on their watch? Well, let's turn to it. Matthew 25. Matthew 25 and let's read again that familiar story. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 6. Here it is again. Matthew 25, 1 says this. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. 25, 2. And five of them were wise and five foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but five but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. These ten virgins represent another type of giants, I believe. You know, in a world filled with every kind of idolatry and abomination imaginable, these symbolic women, or God's church, isn't that right? Living up to the return of the bridegroom, the coming of Jesus Christ, they were considered virgins. I mean, they held the torch of truth high in a dark world. They, too, were caught sleeping on duty, weren't they? Sleeping on duty. Now, who do these sleeping giants represent? Well, you guessed it. As Christ sat looking upon the party that waited for the bridegroom, he told his disciples the story of the ten virgins by their experience, illustrating the experience of the church that shall live just before his second coming. Yes, we have been the sleeping giant. Isn't that right? We have been the sleeping giant. That's a serious charge to be caught sleeping on duty. But fortunately, from the parable we know, that before the bridegroom arrives, she will wake up. Amen? She's going to wake up. And I believe, I really believe that that is beginning to happen. So, the question. Do you long for the bridegroom to come? That's right. Before he comes, she's got to wake up. Isn't that right? So the question is, how do you go about waking a sleeping giant? The title of our talk today. How to awaken a sleeping giant. You know, to sneak up and kick it is probably not a good idea, okay? Some have gone that route, launching an all-out attack upon her and things they think is wrong with this and that. Probably not the best policy. But if we long to wake up and receive that extra oil in preparation for Christ's coming, how do we go about it? How do we do that? Well, I believe that by looking at the characteristics of her sleep, we may find some direction as how she will wake up. And that must happen before we'll get out of here. In the back of my Bible, I have a statement that I've put back here. It's been with me now for years. I put it, I'll have it on the screen here for you. But I love this statement because it's so directional and so practical. You know, let, let me put part of it up there for you. It says this, the first half of it says, When temptations assail you, when care, perplexity, and darkness seem to surround your soul. Have you ever been there? 
Have you been in one of those valleys where it's all dark? You know, darkness and sleep go together. How do you wake up? You know, in the dark valley that we find ourselves in at times, man, it's hard to know which direction to go, to get out, to find your spiritual bearing. It's hard to know. What do you do when you're in the dark? What do you do when you're asleep if you want to wake up? I love this statement. It tells us. You ready? When temptations assail you, when care, perplexity, and darkness seem to surround your soul, here's what you do. You look to the place where you last saw the light. Amen? You love that? That's directional. What was I doing then that I'm not doing now? Or what am I doing now that I wasn't doing then? You see? It gives me direction to know which way to go. As Jesus told the church at Sardis, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the what? The first works, or I will come and remove your candlestick. Lights out. That's sleepy time. Isn't that right? How do we prevent that? Remember and do the first works. Look to the place where you last saw the light. As a church, what may we have been doing years ago that we're not doing so much now that if reversed will wake us up and prepare us for the return of the bridegroom? Well, let's go back to the parable. In the parable, what did her sleep prevent her from doing? Now, if you have your Bibles open, I close mine, but let's go back to Matthew 25 and just read the first verse again. Matthew 25, verse 1 says this, Then the kingdom of heaven, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and did what? Went forth to meet the bridegroom. You see, once they went to sleep, they were no longer going forth, weren't they? Were they? Sleep stopped their movement. Sleep causes the church to lie still or dormant. They no longer are going forth to meet the bridegroom. But when the call comes, behold, the bridegroom cometh, what do they do? In verse 6, it says, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Isn't that right? Once they wake up, they are on the go once again. Sleep causes the church to lie still or dormant. You know, when I was a boy, I had a dream. And it was a frightening dream, and it was one of those dreams that repeated itself numerous times. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had one of those dreams? This is a, a nightmare is what it was. But in my dream, I would dream that I was paralyzed and suffocating. Paralyzed and suffocating. Very extremely uh, frightening dream. And in my dream, I would be just starving for oxygen. And, I, and in my dream, I, I could tell myself, if I could just move, if I could just move even one muscle, even a little finger, this paralysis would be broken and, and I, could, I could get the necessary oxygen I needed and live. And in my dream, as things were getting desperate, I would try with all my might to move, and finally something would move and, and it would be broken. And I would come up often gasping for air, maybe with a blanket wrapped around my neck or a pillow over my face or something like this, you know. If I could just move, the spell would be broken. How are we going to wake up? How is the church going to be awakened? It's through movement. Amen? It's through movement. I truly believe that, and I'll try to sh share why I think that. Let me tell you, as in my dream, the only way we're going to wake up is through movement. That's the only way the death-like slumber will be broken, and we will be prepared for the return of the bridegroom. So... What does it look like? What does it mean for a church to be on the move? How, do, how does the church go forth to meet the bridegroom? Now, I think we could, if we thought about it, we could think of all kinds of scriptural illustrations of what it means for the church to go, but there is one that comes readily to mind. The Gospel Commission. Go ye therefore. Go into all the world, isn't that right? And preach the Gospel. Is that how the church will wake up? Is that how we will be prepared for, for the return of Jesus Christ and hasten his coming I truly believe that it is this is how we wake up we must become mission minded once again amen we must be all about God's mission sleep neutralizes the church's evangelistic thrust and some will say well if that's the case then the Seventh-day Adventist Church is by no means asleep I mean we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in evangelism 
that doesn't sound sleepy. We bring, we bring in the professional evangelist. We spend untold thousands on advertisement. Is that what it means for the church to go forth? Or is it possible that through prosperity, we've been able to hire the work done for us? Isn't that right? Maybe we hire the professional evangelist to come in to give the message so I don't have to. We hire the post office to do our door-to-door -door evangelistic uh, work, passing out flyers. Have, have we been able to hire the work done for us? We spend a lot of money, and sometimes it's not very effective. Many times it's not very effective. Then, are we ready for the bridegroom to come? Is this the characteristics of an awakened church? And some say, well, yes, it is. Matthew 24 tells us that. You're familiar with this verse. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. This verse can be taken two ways, I believe. If you put the emphasis on the words in all the world, what does it say? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The criteria for Christ's coming is what? All the world hearing the gospel. And that's true. But if you change the emphasis and put it on the word preached, what does it say? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now the criteria for Christ's coming is what? The church preaching it. And I believe that is also true. The church has to be preaching the word if she's going to wake up. So do we need to start preaching, sharing the gospel before the Lord will come? Is that, could that be what's been holding him up? Well, is that how we've been asleep? Here's, here's one of those strong statements that I'm sure we've all heard, but it is so powerful, I, I wanted you to see it. And here's what it says. And maybe you know the rest of it. But here we're told, the work of God on this earth can never be finished. That's pretty strong. The work of God in this, this earth can never be finished until. Well, until what? Until we hire more evangelists? Until we spend more money on advertising? Until we hire more Bible workers? No, that's not what it says. The work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those ministers and church officers. There it is, huh? That's how we're going to finish the work. That's how we're going to hasten the Lord's coming. We've all got to pull together, not just some here or there, but everybody pulling together. An awakened church will see its membership passionate about reaching lost people. Amen? So why is that so vital? Why is that so vital for us to be sharing the gospel, sharing the good news? To reach the world? Yes, that's true. But it's also because the only way to keep the gospel in your own heart is by giving it away. Isn't that right? We have, Give and it shall be given unto you. Amen? What will happen if we don't do that? What happens to myself or yourself if we don't give the gospel away. Well, here's what we're told. It is in doing Christ's work that the church has the promise of his presence. Go teach all nations, he said, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. To take his yoke is one of the first conditions of receiving his power. The very, here it is, the very life of the church depends upon her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. There it is. The very life of the church depends. To neglect this work is surely to invite spiritual feebleness and decay. Where there is no active labor for others, love wanes and faith grows dim. And dim lights and sleep go together. Isn't that right? I know this from experience. That if we don't give, we'll get sleepy. For 17 years I served, as Dave mentioned, as a Bible worker. And I love Bible work. I'm a Bible worker at heart. I love to give Bible studies. There's nothing greater than to be sitting in someone's home, opening the Scriptures and see the light come on their eyes and, and see hope come into their heart where they were hopeless and to give them a future. I mean, there's nothing greater than that. But you know, not only this, but my own spiritual life 
is dependent upon that, upon my discharge of the gift God has given me. I, I'm dependent upon that. So if something happens, maybe I'm sick and I miss work for a while, or maybe it's a vacation, I'm not actively involved in, in this ministry, it isn't too long and I begin to feel it. I begin to sense it. Man, I've got to get back at it. You know what I mean? I mean, can you relate to that? It's the same way with any gift. It just so happens I have that gift. But there's many gifts. We have to be using them or we will get sleepy. For the church membership to engage in active service, this is what it's going to take for the church to wake up. And I'm here to say that I believe it is even now beginning to happen. Amen? Things are changing. I think we're seeing a revived interest in evangelism at the local level. You know, in the mid-80s, when I approached the church concerning the possibility of Bible work, back then I was basically told, what's that? I mean, Bible work was a lost art. It's something of the past. But now, 28 years later, it's a new day for the church and Bible workers and that form of evangelism. You know, back then you scarcely ever heard of a Bible worker. Once in a great while I heard of some Bible worker in Timbuktu. But now they're popping up all over. I mean, we have these training schools. We have Life. We have Arise. We have AFCO. We have Mission. We have NMI. We, I mean, they're, they're just popping up everywhere. Bible worker training schools. I think that's a sign of the times. You think so? I think it's a sign of the times. What we're seeing happening down here is an indicator, I believe, of something happening up there. I really do. It's one of the signs. You know, we have felt convicted that this is what it was going to take, this local emphasis and focus and approach to evangelism to fulfill the Gospel Commission. And so, in partnership with the local church, we have hired 36 Bible workers. Amen? We have an army of Bible workers. As Seventh-day Adventists, you know, and, and, and we should be, but many times we're always watching the horizon for a sign to tell us that Jesus is coming soon. Well, I think we should be, but I think what's happening in here is one of the greatest signs that Jesus is coming soon. Things are beginning to stir. I believe we're beginning to wake up. And yet, we can't stop here. We can't stop here. I mean, if all we do is hire another another gun to go out there and do our work for us, we're still going to be cut short and we're not going home anytime soon as we read. And you know, it says we have to all pull together using whatever gifts God has given us. The church members must rally to the work. So let me clarify what we're doing. We have not hired 36 Bible workers. We've hired 36 outreach coordinators, we now call them. And the responsibilities of the outreach coordinator are twofold. Yes, they are to go into the community and seek those that are beginning to respond to the Holy Spirit and help these people on their spiritual journey and lead them to Christ, lead them to the truths of His Word, to church attendance and to baptism. Yes, that's a part of the responsibility of our outreach coordinator. But the other part of our responsibility is to lead the church's outreach team. The outreach team has been adapted from the Share Him uh, model, but what it is basically, it consists of a group of church members that have committed themselves to using their gifts to reach their community. And every church that requests an outreach coordinator must have an outreach team for the outreach coordinator to begin to work with. You know, this idea of coming together as an organized group for service is of divine origin. It really is. I mean, we think of Jesus gathering together his disciples, we think of those gathered together in the upper room in their attempt to fulfill the gospel commission. It's of divine origin. We think of statements like these. Let there be in every church well-organized company of workers to labor in the vicinity of that church. There it is again. It wasn't called an outreach team, but that's what it's talking about. Here's another one. It says this. For months the situation has been impressed on my mind, and I urge that companies be organized and diligently trained to labor in our important cities. These workers should labor two and two, and from time to time should all meet together to relate their experiences and to pray and to plan how to reach the people quickly. Amen. What about, what about your church? What about maybe it's a small church? What then? Here's a good one. 
If there's a large number in the church, <clears throat> let the members be formed into small companies to work not only for church members but for unbelievers. If in one place there's only two or three who know the truth, forget about it. No, 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 not forget about it, huh? If there's only two or three who know the truth, what? Let them form themselves into a band of workers. There's something about coming together in unity to be about our Lord's business that He likes and He blesses. And I get to work with a lot of teams and I see some great things happening. But there's something powerful about it. There's something healthy about it. And one healthy aspect of it is accountability. Isn't that right? And I need, and I think we all need, a healthy layer of accountability. Do you think so? I know I do, and I think we all do. You know, we moved into our home near, the Spokane, uh, near Spokane, Washington in 2008. And we live on some acreage, so we have neighbors, but there's, there's a ways out. But yet I felt a responsibility for my neighbors. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, here I have this relationship with God, and I have this precious, this vital truth for this time, and I think, what do they have? And what do they know? And you know the question, you knew and didn't tell me, and that's a haunting question, isn't it? So I felt burdened that something should be done for our neighbors uh, to make sure they have hope, and they're prepared for what lies ahead. I had good intentions for my neighbors, but you know those good intentions lasted a year and a half or more? And it stayed right at that level until we got some good, healthy accountability. Our conference president at the time uh, instituted an initiative he called Share the Table, where you were to invite a neighbor home on March 24th, I think it was, uh, invite a neighbor over for dinner. So Becky and I look at each other and think, how are we going to invite a total stranger to our home for dinner and expect them to come? We better start getting intentional about forming a relationship with these people. You see what accountability does for us? Healthy accountability? So we begin to do things. We did a number of things. One thing we did that, that was just a hit with them, and I'll share with you, um, the Lord gave us an idea. You know, we play a little music, uh, Becky and I and our girls. Now, our music probably not the most popular music in the world, but we enjoy it. Uh, we play a little bluegrass gospel music. My wife plays rhythm guitar, my daughter does, and they sing, and I play a little banjo. We got this idea that we would go out at Christmas time and go onto the porch of our neighbors and play a bluegrass Christmas song for them, have a plate of goodies. So we did that. Now, in our neck of the woods, it gets pretty cold. I remember that first day out there, 28 degrees, trying to play the banjos, a little challenging. But we did the best we could, but they loved it. And so here we show up on their porch to sing them this song, and they just, they just love it. The, the walls break down, the barriers disappear, and they're saying, hey, Linda, Linda, come listen to this, come listen. I mean, and, and it just started relationships. And that led to an invitation to dinner, back and forth. That led to um, an invitation to go with us to a church program, Journey to Bethlehem, and Journey to the Cross, and some of them came. And then we took it to the next level. Last fall, we went out and invited them to a neighborhood Bible study. And five of them came. Amen? Amen. But without a healthy accountability, it would have stayed right at the good intention level. There's something powerful about coming together that God blesses and things happen. I believe that this idea of an outreach team, an active outreach team in a local church is God-ordained. But the question that sometimes arises is this. You know, our outreach team got off to a good start. Lots of energy and participation, but it began to dwindle down till it finally dwindled down to nothing and ground to a halt. How do you keep this thing going? I'd like to share with you one sure way to kill your outreach team. Here's how you kill your outreach team. Just try to force everybody to serve God with a gift they don't have. That's how you do it. And I'm a master at that. Uh, I did that for a long time. You know, sometimes us Bible workers can get so passionate about our calling in life that we tend to think that you should have the same calling that everybody should be a Bible worker. So we'll do things like this. We'll get up uh, Sabbath morning and we will say, next Sabbath, after potluck, we're all going to gather in the fellowship hall and, and we'll have some materials and we're going to all go out knocking on doors. And consequently, we scare off 97, 98% of the flock, right? 
And we have one or two uh, straggle in there. Um, we've got to change that. I believe that we need all the gifts. I mean, if you had, you wouldn't want everybody on your front lines in the army. Who's going to guard the rear? Isn't that right? I mean, we need to all work together. Everybody has some gift, but not everybody has the same gift. And we need to find ways to utilize all the gifts, and then we'll be a formidable foe to the enemy. Using the gifts that God has given us, I believe that's the key to a successful outreach team. You see, if it's, if it's your passion, nothing can stop it. Isn't that right? My passion was Bible work, and God allowed nothing to stand in the way. Even though it didn't look like it could actually ever materialize, nothing could stand. And I think it's the same way with any gift, whatever gift you have. I mean, I tell people, even if the whole church quit giving Bible studies, I'd still do it. I mean, that's my calling. That's, my, that's what God is, the passion he's put within me. And it's the same way with whatever gift you have. You cannot be happy and satisfied unless you're using it in his service. And so, the outreach coordinator, along with their outreach team, is to find a variety of outreach events that they can implement utilizing the various gifts represented in their group. And the ministry activities are endless. There's, they're doing so many different things. And, um, well, would you like to hear about some of them? All right. I'm going to tell you about some of them. These are exciting, just to kind of stir the pot and give you some ideas of things that can happen. Now, of course, there's always Bible studies. There's always door-to-door -door and, and reaping series. And we're going to spend a lot of time here in the next couple of days talking about how to do those maybe even a little more effectively. But there's other things they're doing. I met with this one group. There was eight of them. And they said that they had come across an elderly gentleman in, in the neighborhood that um, his wife had just passed away. And, and they learned that his garage was um, not wired. It was dark and dangerous for this man. They thought he was going to fall. So that one of their, in their team was an electrician. And they said, you know what? Tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to go out and I'm going to supervise. These people are going to drill holes, pull wires, and we're going to wire this man's garage. They were doing a house repair project for this man. Do you think that's evangelism? Do you think that's going to make a difference down the road when this man receives an invitation to something at the church? Maybe even a reaping series. That's evangelism using various gifts, okay? Well, there's just, and I'm not going to take time to tell you about all these. Christmas in July is another one. Craigslist Ministry, have you heard of that one? I know a few of you have. Craigslist Ministry. This woman goes on Craigslist. She has an idea, or rather, I believe, an inspiration. And she looks on Craigslist and she finds this list of free items. And then she finds this list of items needed. She looks on the free list and these people are giving away a bed. She looks on the item needed list and these people need a bed for their child. She just connects the dots. She goes and picks up the bed, the free bed, and delivers it to those who need the bed. Isn't that cool? And then with some soft connection with the church, a little card or something. I mean, perfect. Well, I, I shared this with one of our outreach coordinators, and he took it to the next level. He went on there and found services needed. So he says, okay, there's a lady that needs some help with her home. He calls up, introduces himself, says, we'd like to come help. She says, well, I don't know who you are. He says, well, we go to this church. We have a church group that wants to get involved. We'd like to come help you. And so she finally agrees. They go to this home. It's winter in Spokane. And she's a single mother with two small children. Inside the house, it's 40 degrees inside. Well, there's a group of them. Somebody knew how to fix the furnace. He got the furnace going, heated it up. It was a mess. They cleaned everything up, painted the walls. Is that evangelism? It is. For long, this woman starts saying, now, who are you? What church? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? She gets involved with the church group. She gets involved in a Bible study. She starts coming to church. And can you imagine what that did for those people? When the man, say, who fixed the furnace to stand in the foyer and this lady comes through the front doors, you know what that did for him? This is evangelism. It's, this man maybe could never give a Bible study, but he could fix the furnace. And that's extremely, it's extremely important that we pool together. We can do great things if we come together. Walmart ministry is another great ministry that's open for us right now. Water bottle ministries, soup kitchens, Kids in Action, after-school program for kids in the community, on and on they, there are these things they're doing. Cooking classes are really popular right now. Exercise groups, acts of kindness ministry. Have you heard of that one? Comes from a church up north, 
they, um, they have a little card. I put it on the screen here for you. It's called uh, uh, Operation Kindness. This gesture is courtesy of Operation Kindness. Pass it on and share your story. And they give a website. On the back side of the card, it says this. Don't you love it when someone goes out of the way to be kind to you? Why not pass it on? Do an act of kindness for someone else today and leave this card with them so they can pass it on and let us know how it made you feel at this website. Isn't that cool? So this guy in Spokane is on his lunch break. He goes to a fast food place, goes to drive up, orders his food. She brings it to him, and he gives her his credit card, and he gives her this card. And he says, I tell you what, the person behind us put their meal on my card. And then when they come to the window, just give them this. So, okay, he drives off, goes back to work, eats his lunch, and realizes he no longer has his credit card. He cannot find the credit card anywhere. This is providential. So that takes him back to that same drive-up window. That same lady there at the window says, Hi, remember me? I was here about an hour ago, and uh, you know I had the little card. I can't find my credit card. Did you forget to give it back to me? She says, No, I gave it back to you. I, I wrapped it in the receipt, and I gave it back to you. And he says, she says, maybe it, maybe it fell out. Maybe it fell between the seat. So he looks between the seat. Sure enough, there's his credit card. This is providential because she says, but I've got to tell you, after you left and paid for the meal behind, that went on for eight cars oh. down the line. They did, and I apparently, hopefully, the card circulated with every one of those. I mean, just wonderful things people are doing, acts of kindness ministries, with a soft connection to the church that breaks down barriers and prejudices so when the invitation for something more comes along, they're ready to listen. Well, let's see what else we have here. Community gardens, ping pong, one church doing ping pong tournaments. Journey to Bethlehem is real popular. Nothing better for a Bible worker to go to, the, go to the door of someone. They say, what church? Oh, I'm with the church that does Journey to Bethlehem. It's like, oh, that, I love that. It's positive, positive instead of negative. Creation Day Camps is like a glorified VBS held in the park. They have all the animals come in. I mean, they're drawing lots and lots of kids from the community. Soul Restoration, a halfway house for women, one church. God's Closet. Have you heard of God's Closet down here? God's Closet is kind of like Community Center, but it's, uh, it's different. It, they open uh, once a quarter, and their focus is children's clothing only. And anybody from the community can come, and for $1 can fill up three bags of children's clothing. And they are having hundreds of people, a lot of press coverage, hundreds of people showing up for this. And, 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 and they're coming, and just for a, a slight investment, they get to fill up the children's clothing. And then <clears throat> the people that are waiting to get in, see, they're intentional. When they're waiting in line, they have a little a registration card they have to fill out, <clears throat> name and so forth. And then at the bottom of that is services provided. All kinds of services provided. Do you know what that first time... Just by giving the people this is an opportunity. They had 40 requests for Bible studies. 40. I mean, that's a Bible worker's dream to have 40 requests for Bible studies. Isn't that right? They had 200 requests for children's ministries. Just by giving people opportunity. I mean, it's wonderful. Single mom's oil change. That's another one. They open every so often. They have a garage and they do single mom's oil change. And people come from the community and they can get their oil change for free. Um, the church gets involved. There's lots of participation. The momentum gets going. Um, people, the, the, the people that wait there, they talk with them in the waiting room. I mean, it's wonderful. Single Mom Oil Chain, another great ministry. Fred Meyer's ministry, another good one. It's going on right now. Small engine repair, guitar classes, glow. You know the glow ministry. There's pocket signs, fair booths, cowboys for little angels. I got to tell you about this one. This is the last one on my list here. Cowboys for Little Angels, this Bible worker comes to the church, okay? And he starts holding, he starts holding uh, classes, teaching people how to be Bible workers. Isn't that right? Okay? He's not getting a lot of participation. Very few. It dwindles down to nothing. There's one woman that's really giving him a hard time, okay? He can't get anywhere. He's getting discouraged. And he gets this idea. Let's, let's have a booth at the fair, a health booth. Well, that gets a few people on board. The momentum, momentum starts, okay? Well, they had this booth, and this one fellow is helping him at the booth in the church, has um, horses, ponies at home. And he notices a lot of kids there coming through the booth. So he brings in, next day, a bale of hay in his saddle. Puts the saddle on the bale of hay, and these kids want to get on the saddle. And he says, hey, why don't we have, why don't we offer free pony rides for the children at the church? Free pony rides. So they put up a little registration. They get 37 families sign up for free pony rides at the church. 
well, the day comes and they have everything prepared and, and um, they have, they have a, the little corral with the ponies. They hired somebody to come in and sing cowboy Christian songs for them and, and they have a little booth where they're giving away uh, winter coats to kids in need. They have another booth with a bale of hay and a steer head where little kids come practice lassoing. Uh, they have, but then they're intentional. While all this has happened, pony rides and stuff, the kids can come to this other booth and put a cowboy hat on, some western whatever, and get their picture taken. Well, the Bible worker now needs an address to deliver the picture. Okay? And, and, then, and then this is all in conjunction near the church where they have a big banner up there uh, advertising their prophecy seminar that's going to be starting on the four horsemen or something. No, I'm not just kidding on that. But anyhow, <laughs> but, but at any rate, th so there's awareness, you know. Well, <clears throat> I got to tell you, I got to tell you that, that um, they had a lot of people involved, right? A lot of people involved. And, and after it was over, this one woman that was giving this Bible worker such a hard time comes to him and he sa she says, you know, there's a lady that's just started coming back to church, kind of on the fringes. I would like to give her Bible studies, but I don't know how. Would you help me? Isn't that cool? I mean, that's how God wants to work. I believe if we get everybody on board and start doing things, that he'll work out these problems and he'll give us, he'll give us success and he'll give us victories. And I have a few minutes left here, so I'll hurry on. All these ministries help build bridges and form relationships with non-believers. But the ultimate goal is to help them take that next step with the Lord. That happens during reaping series. Isn't that right? Reaping series. We can't neglect the reaping series, but before you reap, you have to sow. And all these things are sowing events. Now, Bible, work, uh, Bible studies and door-to-door, -door, that's all a part of that. But it's just a part. You've got to use all the gifts in, in the mix. And then rather than spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on advertisement that's really not that effective and we're not in the mix then, instead we have a natural pool of interest and friends that we can in invite to take that next step. Isn't that cool? Which is much more effective. I mean the percentage of those come in through personal invitation versus a handbill, is, there's no difference, you know. I mean there's a big difference. There's hardly any come in through handbills and most of them come in through the invitation. An awakened church will once again take ownership of its mission and I believe it's beginning to happen. And yet, any time we are about our Father's business, we attract the unwanted attention of the enemy. Isn't that right? And we face that. You face that. We faced it there. We faced physical attacks, spiritual attacks. And I'm sure you have all heard things like this. This is spiritual propaganda, I call it where they'll say things like, the Lord, you know, this is all right what you're doing, but the Lord is not going to work now to bring many into the church until the church is ready to receive them. And that's a, sp a partial quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, um, but I believe it's a half-sleepy truth. They say the church, many won't come in until the church is ready. Listen to this statement. It's a half-sleepy truth. Oh, sorry, there's the, <laughs> there's the cowboy for little angels, one of the pictures I put on there for you. Isn't that cute? Here it is. One of the divine plans for growth is what? Impartation. The Christian is to gain strength by strengthening others. He that waters shall be watered also himself. This is not merely a promise. It is a divine law. In the fulfilling of this law is the secret of spiritual growth. So don't fall for that. It's a decoy, smokescreen of the devil to keep the giant asleep. It's partial truth. For although God will not work now to bring many into the church until the church is ready to receive them, the truth of it is the church will never be ready to receive them until they attempt to bring many in. You see there how that works? That's one major way that we mature and get ready. Others say, well, no, an awakened church is going to have to have the extra oil and nothing much is going to happen until we receive the latter rain. So they sit by and wait for the latter rain. And they say, the Lord will not pour out His Spirit until we get sin out of our life, until the blotting out of sin takes place so we can receive the freshness of the Lord. And so they sit back and they wait. But, you know, as long as I simply wait, as long as I simply stay focused on sin and just wait for the latter rain, it's never going to come. And there's a reason for that. Self is our problem. But there's only one, there's one major way 
to cure the self problem. And it's not through fault finding, criticism, or waiting. What is it? Look at this one. This is a great one. Strength to resist evil is best gained, how? By aggressive service. There it is, huh? The spirit of unselfish labor for others gives depth, stability, and Christ-like loveliness to the character and brings peace and happiness to its possessor. The only way to grow in grace is to be disinterestedly doing the very work which Christ has enjoined upon us. Amen? Well, here's another powerful one. Look at this. The Holy Spirit will come to all who are begging for the bread of life. Amen? But if you stop there, it's not true. You know what the rest of it says? The Holy Spirit will come to all who are begging for the bread of life to give to their neighbors. There's how we're going to get the Holy Spirit and be ready for Jesus to come. That's how we're going to wake up. We have to be proactive if we want to receive the latter rain. We must be about our Father's business. Like this one says, when we unite our hearts in unity with Christ and our lives in harmony with His work, the Spirit that fell on the disciples on the day of Pentecost will fall on us. One more here real quick. Look at this one. We shall be entrusted with the Holy Spirit according to our capacity to receive and our ability to impart it to others. Ah, there. If we want the Holy Spirit, we've got to be about the Father's business. I mean, I've concluded in my own life, and I think it's true, the Lord will not give me the latter rain to enable me to accomplish that which I am not attempting. You see? I have to be attempting before he will give me that gift. An awakened church is at war. They are about their father's business, which is winning souls. And that's the only way we're going to get the latter rain to finish the work. Outreach coordinators and outreach teams, we believe, have, has been the missing link. And we come together with this purpose in mind. The Holy Spirit likes it. For a final quote, here's what he says he will do. Check this out. The convocation to the church, as in camp meetings the assembly of the home church, and all occasions where there is personal labor for souls <clears throat> are God's appointed opportunities for giving the early and latter rain. There it is. Can't say it much clearer than that. Are you serious about getting out of here and going home today? I mean that home? Then we know what we have to do, huh? We have our marching orders. We must be about our Father's business. I hope some of these things have piqued your interest, things you might be able to do and incorporate in your church and uh, your communities uh, in an endeavor to reach people for Christ and helping them to get to the point where they can take that next step, that, that next step in their journey with Christ and introduce them to Jesus Christ, which is what we're all about here. And for the next few days, I'm going to be talking about how to do that, um, actually lead people to Jesus Christ. Over the past 23 years in Bible work, the Lord has um, helped me to develop some tried and proven methods of how to find people in the community that are seeking him and to help them take that next step in that journey. How to give this Bible study to them, how to lead people to Christ and the truths of God's Word. We're going to be talking about that, doing some role playing up front here and showing you some of the things we do. So Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The question I'll leave you with is this, pretty much, how's the fishing? How's the fishing been around here? Well, if your answer, your personal answer to that question is, is less than satisfactory, I hope you'll be here. We're going to talk about how you can find those people in your community and lead them to Jesus Christ. Well, William Borden was a young man who gave millions of dollars away to the cause of world evangelism. But even greater than that sacrifice was his consecration of his life to ministry. You know, as a... Uh, as a, as a seminary student, he felt called to, to the unreached Muslims of northwest China. So, way back in 1930, 13 actually, 1913, renouncing the rest of his fortunes, he set sail for China, but he never made it. His journey took him to, uh, to, China, from, to China, took him to Cairo to study Arabic and Islam, but shortly after his arrival in Egypt on his way, he was stricken with smi spinal meningitis, and he died at the age of 25. But listen to this. After his death, Borden's possessions were shipped back home to his family, which included his Bible. And going through his Bible, they found these words. No reserve. No reserved. With a date beside it, placing it after he had renounced his fortunes 
in favor of missions. No reserve. At a later point, he added these words. No retreat. No retreat with a date at the time he was diagnosed with meningitis. And shortly before he died, as he lay ill in his hospital bed, he penned the final entry in his Bible. And it said, no regret. No regret. No reserve, no retreat, and no regret summed up the life of this young man, fully devoted to the commission of Jesus Christ. So, if today was my last day, if today was your last day, how would your life be summed up? How would it be summed up? Are we sold out to Christ's commission with no reserve, no retreat, and no regret? You know, my appeal as we close to you this morning is simply this. I appeal to you to intentionally use whatever gift God has given you to save some soul for the kingdom. Amen? That's my appeal. And my plea to you this morning is simply this. Like a mighty army, let's band together, huh? Let's pool our gifts together and join together and go forward like he did with no reserve, no retreat, and we will have no regret. Amen? Let's, let's stand for prayer. Kind Heavenly Father, we love you. And yet we realize that, I realize I have many times miserably fallen short of your ideal for me. And I think uh, we're probably all in the same boat here. So Lord, we are coming to consecrate ourselves to you and to your service. Help us, Lord, through the power of your Spirit to identify the gift you have given us and to use it relentlessly to save souls. Help us to go forward and never look back. No reserve, no retreat, and we will have no regret. Bless each one to this end. Help us have a great day and a great camp meeting together. And may we be in the kingdom of heaven soon. Now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.